Tucker Carlson is a bad guy, but he's smart. I don't know that him being the number two to Donald Trump's number one is going to be good for either one of them. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And today we're going to be drafting who we think is going to be Donald Trump's vice presidential nominee. This episode of Liberal Tears is brought to you by Z-Biotics, the pre-alcohol probiotic your first drink for a better tomorrow. And this is obviously important. It's obviously in the news right now because everybody groveling, falling over themselves to show their fealty to Donald Trump. And the point of all of this is clearly to get into Trump's good graces so that he can choose one of them as his vice president. That is all true, Brian. And it's also clickbait speculation. So thank you for tuning in, like and share. All right, I'm gonna flip a coin in the air. Brian's gonna call it to see who goes first. You ready? Yep, let's do it. Heads. Tails. Sorry, pal. I am going to go with my first pick, Christy No. Now, some people can't figure out his popularity. Why are people so loyal to him? I'm convinced it's because we have never seen anything or anyone like him ever before. And those who hate America know that he will fight every single day to stop them from destroying this country. Okay, here's why I think Christy Nome is a potential favorite to be the vice presidential nominee. Electoral benefits of South Dakota? They're none. But I do think the Trump campaign knows that abortion is likely to be the single biggest headwind for their campaign. They want diversity on the ticket. That could be gender-based. That could also be racial diversity. I think they'll ultimately decide that Donald Trump is going to need to peel off some of the suburban women that he has lost to Joe Biden. They're going to need to try to push back on concerns about uh, stripping away abortion access. She's terrible on the policy, but I do think they're going to view it as a identity. Right. And also Donald Trump is very big on central casting. Christy Noem is obviously very good looking. And so I think that just by virtue of that, that'll be enough for him from somebody who comes, you know, from background in television. Yeah. The one X factor here is according to the Daily Mail, Christy Noem had a years long affair with Corey Lewandowski, who used to work for Trump. I don't know how to work that into the equation. Yeah. I don't, I don't know weird. what like his relationship with Corey Lewandowski is enough to know whether that's going to hurt or yeah. help her. But uh, mostly I don't want to know. Yeah, <laughs> but it is what it is. My choice. I'm going to go with Elise Stefanik. Oh, good one. How do you read uh, calling someone horse face from the president of the United States? I think it's unacceptable. Uh, I disagree with the rhetoric. Uh, I've disagreed with the president's rhetoric uh, numerous times when it comes to how he addresses women. Would you consider being his running mate? Of course I'd be honored. I've said that for a year to serve in a future Trump administration in any capacity. Elise Stefanik is pure naked, unadulterated ambition. Yeah. And and what makes it even more apparent is that she came into Congress not too long ago, by the way, as like an avowed moderate. And she even promoted her independent bona fide. She would say like where she was ranked in terms of the most independent members of Congress. Now she is just straight party line when it comes to Donald Trump. She went to Harvard. She's yeah. like friends with Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> yeah. She ran as a moderate. And then over time has just become magnified, magnified, magnified. She has completely changed her entire identity to just be this extreme MAGA right candidate. And you know what? Trump won't respect her, but he'll like that, right? Like he likes the people that once criticized him that then bow and kiss the ring. And they just become useful for him. The more people that he can scare into being deferential to him, they're useful until, of course, the moment that they're not. And then he'll, of course, discard them the moment that he needs to. Yeah. Okay. with my second pick, and this is a bit of a swerve here, Brian, I'm going to go with Tulsi Gabbard. Wow. I think we got a clip. You're being considered for a VP slot. Is that something you're open to? I would be open to that. My mission is to serve our country. I want to be in a position to solve problems, Jesse. And we got a lot of them to solve. Trump loves people who supported someone else and then came to his side. He loves it even more if you're a Democrat who came all the way to the Republican Party just to endorse Donald Trump, to endorse him. She now has this like far right audience because she goes on Tucker Carlson all the time. To that point though, on this idea that she presents like an incentive structure for disaffected Democrats to come over to Republicans, Democrats love that too. I mean, we have a ton of spokespeople. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Lincoln Project, Nicole Wallace is a former totally. George W. Bush staffer. There are a ton oh, we, of people. We treat former Republicans like, like their like royalty, opinion right? is better than ours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like they're more important than so us. So there is this obsession on both sides where people do like love, you know, disaffected affected Democrats or Republicans. Because they show that you were right and that you won the argument and you brought them from one side to the other. Yeah. Okay, for my next choice, I'm going to go with Nancy Mace. Would you be open to being on the ticket as a vice presidential candidate with with the former President Trump? 
Well, I'm flattered by the question. Um, I do strongly believe, I've said this from the beginning, that we need to have a woman on the ticket. We need to have a woman that can reach out to independent voters and suburban women, whoever that may end up being. But we're a long way from that process. So Nancy Mace checks a lot of boxes that we've already spoken about. She's a woman, so she may give the impression that Donald Trump's ticket would be better on the issue of abortion. It yeah. wouldn't be. She used to be more moderate on abortion, but now she toes the party line. She voted last year against a bill that would enshrine Roe into law. She missed a vote on another bill that would reaffirm the right for someone seeking an abortion to travel across state lines. She's, again, just as extreme as the rest of them, but relies on her longstanding branding to kind of uh, give this impression that she's someone who she isn't. Yeah, she's got an interesting bio. She was the first woman to graduate from the Citadel's Corps of Cadets program. And yeah, she went from this sort of more moderate position to full on MAGA. Yeah. For example, she was one of nine House Republicans who voted to hold Steve Bannon in contempt for defying a subpoena to appear before the Jan 6 committee. Then in 2023, a couple years later, she goes on Steve Bannon's show to complain about the debt ceiling, right? So she's fully gotten herself back into the far right graces. One weird thing, Brian, she spoke at the prayer breakfast in South Carolina And to a room full of conservative Christians said that her fiance had tried to have sex with her that morning. And she said she couldn't because she was going to be late. Throw to the clip because it's so weird. (laughs) Patrick, my fiance, tried to pull me by my waist over this morning in bed. And I was like, no, baby, we don't got time for that this morning. Uh, I got to get to the prayer breakfast and I got to be on time and a little TMI. But um, normal fodder for the prayer breakfast. Classic prayer breakfast. Classic. (laughs) Who among us? With the next pick, I'm going with Katie Britt. I'm Katie Brett. As a Christian conservative mother, I know that life is God-given. I also know that I've had about enough of radical liberals lecturing us about following the science while being okay with taking the lives of innocent babies in the ninth month of pregnancy. Where I'm from, I mean, that's called murder. And this mama, I'm not going to take it. I approve this message because saving babies starts with sending more pro-life moms to the U.S. Senate. Look, she's obviously an attractive person. Trump, again, wants someone out of central casting. She also delivers truly heinous lines with a smile. Right. That was the weirdest thing. I mean, it it is it's straight like Dan Bongino rhetoric. But in in this in this like warm, fuzzy, gauzy wrapping. Democrats want to kill nine month old babies. (laughs) No, they don't. Again, back to the central casting point. She is married to a former NFL player. They met when they both were at Alabama, where he played offensive tackle. Here's what bothers me about Katie Britt. In 2004, she used to work for Senator Richard Shelby. She was Shelby's deputy press secretary. That was my job in 2004. I should not be the vice president of the United States. That is disgusting. <laughs> that is outrageous. Someone should rethink this. Yeah. Or maybe you should. Maybe you got stuck maybe on I the podcast aim, track. Aim higher. Aim higher. <laughs> for my next choice, I'm going to go with Tim Scott. I have to say, I don't, this is in a very positive way, Tim Scott. He has been much better for me than he was for himself. I watched his campaign. You can see from that clip that Tim Scott is perfectly happy to be a supplicant for Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump literally makes fun of him on that stage. And Tim Scott is like, ha, 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 thank you so much, sir. Please, can I have another? It's funny watching Trump talk about Tim Scott. Like, he can't say anything that's not mostly a criticism. Yeah, it's it's like s- these small compliments wrapped in criticism. Yeah, he's like, he's like, Tim really sucked it promoting himself and his own candidacy, but he's a great surrogate for me. Yeah. Welcome, like the, Tim Scott. There is some, like, n- morsel of a compliment somewhere in there, but you have yeah. to trudge through all of the all of the shit-talking to get to it. Listen, d- Tim Scott very recently announced that he was engaged to be married after all this speculation about whether he was a virgin, whether he dated anybody. I think Donald Trump probably thinks that's a little weird and uh, is, is skeptical, but we'll see. Who knows? It's getting hard now because they all just really suck. Um, Not to be confused with the first half of the group. Yeah. <laughs> with my next pick, I'm going to go with Sarah Huckabee Sanders. 100% definitely voted for him. I feel great. I mean, you know, there's not a poll in the country that not only has him dominated on Super Tuesday, but also in November. Uh, this is a head-to-head matchup at this point between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And he's the clear favorite, has all the momentum, momentum and I feel really good about him winning again. The reason I think that Donald Trump might consider her to be his vice president is... He's not going to view the VP as a partner or a peer. He's going to view you as a staffer. She was the White House press secretary, which means she has a ton of experience going on TV, fighting with reporters, battling for him. She knows how to kiss the ring, stay in his good graces. You know, she held out on endorsing Trump for a while, and it seems like that might have pissed him off. So we'll see if he holds a grudge. But 
could see her being on ticket. I mean, when you had Sean Spicer in there, I thought Sean Spicer was terrible, and he was a laughing stock. That's yeah. why he didn't last. Scaramucci didn't do a good job. He, that's why he didn't last. She lasted a long time because she's able to lie for him with such shamelessness that she actually would make a very good candidate for yeah. vice president. I mean, she ran for governor. She won. Like, she might be thinking, you know, she might want that Oval Office. Yeah, there is the saying that nobody in this country is governor without also having ambitions to yeah. be president. every governor and senator looks in the mirror and sees a president. Yeah. All right, for my next choice, I'm going to go with Byron Donalds. A lot of people said that that's why the black people like because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. Congressman, it sounds like Donald Trump was implying that he can win black voters because they get indicted all the time, too. Is that what he was saying? Well, I think it's in part of that. That's part of it, Kristen. Look, the, the, it was a great night, Friday night in Columbia, South Carolina. The president was really just enjoying himself. It was a great celebration for black conservatives across our country. But let's be very clear. Our economy is a mess. Our border is completely unsecured. The these things are causes of major concerns for black voters like it is for every voter in our country. But then when you layer on the fact that, yes, this is political persecution from the Department of Justice and from radical DAs throughout our country, this is something similar that black people had to deal with the, with the justice system themselves. The same way he was looking for, you know, he's likely considering women uh, nominees. He's also likely considering uh, minority nominees. I mean, any anybody who is not a white man is going to give a permission structure to some other demographic to be able to then cast their votes for him. Byron Donalds is also very disciplined. I mean, you can see there that when he was asked a question that was just a brutal question, and there's no right answer to it because what Donald Trump did on that stage by equating black support for him with his indictments is insane, but went right back to his talking points. Byron Donalds is he's good on TV. He's just so new that I wonder if that will set Trump off. Like, I think he's pretty young. But yeah, I don't know. He, he does seem like someone who's got... um got a future in the party. Yeah, I mean, look, he's he's low on my list because he's not a star. And I do yeah. think that to some degree, Donald Trump wants a star next to him. I think he doesn't want like some kind of like relatively obscure person. Yeah. But the, the flip side of that is he doesn't have a lot of baggage. And in the same way that Jim Jordan couldn't become the next Speaker of the House and Mike Johnson did, Byron Donalds might not have all the baggage that would prevent him from being chosen. Yep. So with my next pick, I'm going to choose Tucker Carlson. Is there anything you would like to see? Uh, you know, and there'd be a couple that I'd love to see, if only just for like the vice presidential debate, right? I'd love to see like a Tucker Carlson go up against Kamala Harris. Just, what about Tim? Just like that would be fun. And, and listen, Tim's a good friend of mine. Tim's a great guy. Uh, you know, so these these are all. You know, I think my father mentioned some of those as potentials, and there's probably a couple that he didn't mention that are potentials, and uh, we'll see. But you know. And, and not my call to make. I'm sure I'll be vocal, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Just like windmeals his arms the whole time. <laughs> He's like, not my call to make. My father wouldn't listen to me. But if any of you talk to him, please let him know that I love him. <laughs> not my call to make, but dad, call me uh, if you're listening. I'd love to talk to you. So if Tucker Carlson ran for president, I would be worried. He is a demagogue. He is great on TV. He's great at driving a message. He has a huge fan base. People know who he is. He's a scary populist demagogue. Tucker Carlson is a bad guy, but he's smart. Yeah. And he knows how terrible this job will be. I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that he'd want to be Trump's whipping boy for four years. But I don't know. People in D.C. are obsessed with power. They do crazy things. Tucker Carlson just got on a plane to go suck up to Vladimir Putin for a couple of days. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe but I think be... that was ultimately for Tucker Carlson. Right. And I don't know that him being very much the number two to Donald Trump's number one is going to be good for either one of them. Yeah. OK, for my next choice, I'm going to go with Ron DeSantis. You can be the most worthless Republican in America, but if you kiss the ring, he'll say you're wonderful. Before we begin, I'd like to take time to congratulate Ron DeSantis. But as you know, he left the campaign trail today at 3 p.m. And in so doing, he was very gracious and he endorsed me. So I appreciate it. I think it's not lost on Donald Trump that Ron DeSantis is probably the next guy in line for the mm -hmm. Republican primary. And so it, it may be a neat little way for him to say, you're going to be my number two. You're going to be very much subservient to me. But in doing so, we can also, you know, make sure that we keep the White House in 24 and then 28 and then 32 and just kind of like have a very much set the party up for success uh, in, in that way. It would be awesome if he made him his VP and then endorsed someone else in 2028. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest. <laughs> it would be incredible to watch Trump choose DeSantis and just belittle him and berate him every <laughs> yeah. single day publicly. But I just I don't I don't see it happening. My final pick is going to be Dr. Ben Carson. You know, you, you, you think about the Bible and uh, King David. Uh, 
most of those people probably, if they were alive back in those days, would have said, oh, what a horrible guy. You know, the episode with Bathsheba and some of the other right. things that he did. And yet he was a man after God's own heart. God uses different people for different times. Here's the thing about Ben Carson. He has a genuine talent. 1987, he separated conjoined twins that were connected at the head. So that might serve him well if he can extricate Lindsey Graham's head from Trump's ass. <laughs> huh? Huh? <laughs> That's it, people. See you later. So that's the joke I wrote down for this one. Ben Carson was my favorite candidate in the 2016 campaign because he just kind of looks lost. <laughs> you yeah. know, like there'd be debates and I'd just be waiting for them to cut back to him, have him like juggling or like <laughs> like staring at like a butterfly flying away or something. You just like, it's like, buddy, come back to us, you know, like yeah. pick it up, speed it up. So I, I don't know that he has that much political talent. I think he got famous because of that campaign and all the attention on it. He also wrote a book called Gifted Hands. And in that book, he talks about trying to stab a kid to death in ninth grade, which is just a weird story. So weird that even Trump tweeted, the Carson story is either a total fabrication or, if true, even worse, trying to hit mother over the head with a hammer or stabbing friend. <laughs> Not really sure what that was a reference to, but I don't know. At least the guy's done something with his life. Perhaps. I don't think that counts for much in the Republican Party. That no, may, that may actually be a demerit. For my last choice, I'm going to go with Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah, so look, I, 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 what I've said is I'm going to respect whatever decision President Trump makes. We can't take the election this November for granted. That's actually the next step right here. So there's a deep bench. There's a lot of great people in our party. I'm going to support whatever decision he makes. But most importantly, we have to win in that decisive election this fall. That's my sole focus. Now, in terms of the strategy here, I don't know what Vivek would ever be able to afford Donald Trump. Like, his entire brand is Donald Trump. And so, like, he brings nothing else to the table. It's like if the Beatles brought a Beatles cover band on tour with them. It's it's the same thing. They get <laughs> You get nothing else with Vivek. By the end of the campaign, Vivek was seemingly trying to appeal to, like, the kind of RFK Jr. conspiracy theory yeah. loving types. And, yeah, I don't think he brings you anything. Also... I suspect Trump will toy with Vivek. He'll dangle this in front of him to get him to do stuff. But he's too fucking annoying. He's too annoying. He's too obnoxious. Donald Trump knows that, by the yes. way. He like, not e like even that guy, for as much of a prick as he is, like he can clearly recognize he, what works and what doesn't work with people yeah. and how certain people rub others the wrong way. Yes. And that's that's clearly Vivek. Hey, it's Tommy again. I want to tell you guys about the game changing product I use anytime I go out and have a drink or two. It's called Seabiotics. Zbiotics is a pre-alcohol probiotic drink and is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists, bona fide nerds, to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night Drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Uh, as you guys know, it's an election year, and uh, we here at Crooked Media HQ are pulling some more late nights to make sure we have that sweet, sweet political content for you. But sometimes, look, we get stressed out too. You got to take the edge off. You have a drink or two, maybe three. But I always make sure to have Zbiotics as my first drink of the night to make sure that I feel my best the next day. Go to zbiotics.com slash rank to get 15% off your first order when you use the code rank at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this video. We're going to each take about 30 seconds here and make our final pitch to you. So Tommy, you went first. So let's hear, uh, let's hear your rundown first. A little closing argument. Here's why I have the best list. So we got Christy Nome. She is running hard for the job. She looks strong and tough up there, which she's delivering fiery speeches on his behalf. She can appeal to women voters. She's built relationships in the Trump orbit. Some might say too close, uh, but we'll sort that out another time. Then we got Tulsi Gabbard. She used to be a Democrat. And now she's a Republican. Trump can brag about how he's so great that he's even getting support from Democrats, elected Democrats, no less. Uh, then we got Katie Britt. She puts a friendly face on terrifying right wing <laughs> fascist extremism. You got Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, she was a staffer. She was good on TV, but she knows her place in the Trump orbit. She knows that she works for him. This is not an equal partnership, uh, and she would do the job accordingly. Then we get Tucker Carlson. He's a scary demagogue. I worry about him running for president himself, but honestly, he might be too good, and that's why Trump might not want to pick him. Finally, we got Ben Carson. He has genuine talent, 
but he also does every interview and looks like he just took an Ambien. <laughs> so I'm not sure that's going to cut it. That is why I have the far superior list. A good list, a good list. But with my first one right off the bat, Elise Stefanik, Naked Ambition. This woman bragged about her moderate bona fides. Now she's fully on board the Trump train. And you've got Ma Nancy Mace, who's not in a dissimilar position. Another person who was an avowed moderate pr framed herself as being good on women's issues. Now, again, fully on board with Trump. Then you've got Tim Scott, Byron Donalds. Both of them offer a permission structure for black voters who Donald Trump is taking uh, a, a really strong swing at right here um, as he tries to, to lure them in for 2024. For. Then you've got Ron DeSantis, who I think m there might be a world in which he views him as the heir apparent after Trump's reign is over. And so maybe he wants to make it a more seamless transition. Probably not. Uh, and then Vivek Ramaswamy, who pretty much doesn't have any chance because I think that everybody in the Trump orbit just knows that he is a clown who will so do anything for some attention. And God damn, he's obnoxious. So the last episode we did was the worst moments in history from CPAC. It seems that Brian re-upped his contract with the Chinese bot farm, and he won 54% to 46%. So that sucks for me. Now, Tommy, last week... Uh, we witnessed some of Roger Stone's amazing dance moves, and we also witnessed Tulsi Gabbard's white suit. Tommy could not stop talking about how much he loved this white suit. I, I gotta say, the white suit looked great, though. So we figured now it may be a good time for you to don a white suit of your own and show us your favorite dance moves here. So what, what do you say we get over to the studio and see what you've got? Let's great. do it. Let's do it. Hi, I got a tape I want to play. All right, well, that's our draft. Uh, we have uh, Tommy, who looks like Roger Stone threw up all over him right here. How was that? I feel like Babe Ruth's like sad grandson. <laughs> Al Capone's like shitty cousin. No one talks to him anymore. If you enjoyed that, make sure to vote for me for the next one, and we'll continue to make Tommy regret his life choices. Yeah.